talk about a new book that has been recently released entitled Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church. And uh, here I am alone, but I also assume that there are other people, all of you, out there, and I'm going to be taking your questions. But for the first 15 or 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is to talk about the book and to kind of contextualize it against the uh, other titles that I have done and cover some of the main points. But then in a, in a little bit, I'd like to also begin answering some of your questions. So the first thing I'd like to do is just to explain a little bit about this book called Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the Early Church. It's my 12th book with Random House Doubleday Image, and I'm really grateful for that uh, because going back about uh, 15 years ago, I wrote my very first book called The Lamb's Supper, The Mass as Heaven on Earth. And in that book, I tried to tie together two things that I'm also uniting here, and that is sacred scripture and our liturgical worship, or more specifically, the New Testament as the fulfillment of the old and then the Holy Eucharist as the context in which that fulfillment occurs. So it's not just back in the first century that Christ fulfilled it. It's in the 21st century still that through the power of the Holy Spirit, this fulfillment continues in our own life experience, in our own life together when we gather to assemble and worship. But consuming the Word is different than the Lamb's Supper. Uh, the Lamb's Supper I wrote primarily for Catholic readers, whereas Consuming the Word is for Catholic and non-Catholic readers. And the reason why I did that is because over the course of the last five or ten years, I've had a lot of conversations uh, in the context of friendship. But in particular, I was teaching at St. Vincent's Seminary for about six years, driving back and forth from Steubenville, Ohio to Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and reconnecting with an old friend of mine from high school. And it's interesting because, uh, well, let me just take a step back and, uh, and situate this. Because uh, a few years ago, uh, I was in an airport, which I'm, I'm often in an airport. Uh, I ran into a, a fellow who recognized me, and we started talking. And I thought, well, maybe he's seen me on EWTN or whatever. And then suddenly I realized, no, we graduated from high school together back in 1975. And Chris was sort of eager to tell me something that uh, had changed since then, and that was uh, he was no longer a cradle Catholic. He explained to me, Scott, I'm, I've been looking forward to the day when I could tell you I am now an evangelical Bible Christian. And I said to Chris, well, I'm now an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian. And uh, he was rather shocked. And uh, after we exchanged greetings and all of that, we ended up reconnecting on the phone for the course of, well, actually for several months. We ended up having conversations that I would have while I was driving to uh, seminary. When I was driving to St. Vincent's in Latrobe, I, it was about an hour and 20 minute drive, and for at least an hour each week, Chris and I would connect, and uh, he was sort of eager to, to turn the cafeteria tables around on me, so to speak, by asking me the questions I used to put to him and to his fellow Catholic friends back at Upper St. Clair High School. Uh, one question in particular I remember he kind of threw at me he said, okay, Scott, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? He said, because what I'm now convinced of is what you used to show me, and that is the Mass is a meal. The sacrifice is what happened to Jesus on Calvary. So how do you answer that now that you're an evangelical Bible Catholic Christian? And I said, well, the first thing, Chris, is to recognize our common ground. Because as Christians, whether we're Catholic or Protestant, we share so much more in common than where we differ. I, you know, sometimes we tend to fixate on our our differences and forget the fact that we have about at least 80 to 90 percent of our faith in common. I said, so first of all, let's affirm what we share, and that is what happened to Jesus on Good Friday at Calvary was in fact the sacrifice. And he looked at me and he said, whew, you know, I thought there for a minute you really were a Catholic. I'm, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I am. But I mean, this is something that Catholics and Protestants affirm, that the sacrifice of Christ it really is consummated on, on, on Calvary, on Good Friday. But I said, the second thing that I'd like to show you is sort of what the early church fathers showed me. And that is, if we had been there at Calvary on Good Friday, witnessing the crucifixion as devout Jews who had been following Jesus over the last, you know, two or three years, we would not have gone home that evening and recounted to our family members and friends that what we had witnessed was a sacrifice. And he asked me why. I said, well, for one simple reason, because as devout Jews, 
we would know that a sacrifice can only take place inside of Jerusalem, inside the Jerusalem temple on top of an altar where a Levitical priest would be standing there ready to preside at the liturgy of sacrifice. Whereas Jesus was crucified outside the walls, far from the temple, where there were no altars with priests standing by ready to offer a sacrifice. What we would have gone home and recounted to our family members and friends would not have been a sacrifice. It would have been a Roman execution, plain and simple, and a rather brutal and bloody one at that. I said, so Chris, the real question for us as Christians is this. How did a Roman execution suddenly get turned into not just a sacrifice, but the supreme sacrifice of all times, one that retires all of the animal offerings in the Old Testament? And I stopped just to let the question sink in. And he was sort of like, whoa, and I'm like, I know. I mean, that, that's the question that the early church fathers put to me. How does a Roman execution suddenly get turned into the supreme and holiest sacrifice of all? And I said, the only answer that the early church fathers had was one that they got from St. Paul. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7, he said something that they really picked up on. Namely, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us Therefore, let us keep the feast. And in the subsequent chapters there in 1 Corinthians, the feast that he's talking about is what he subsequently explicates in terms of the Holy Eucharist. I said, that's the key, I think, that we have to recognize that the only way to see what happened to Jesus on Good Friday is to look at it in the light of what he was doing with the disciples on Holy Thursday. Because what was he doing in the upper room the night before? Well, he was celebrating the Passover, the Passover of the Old Covenant, one last time. But that's not all he was doing. He was fulfilling it as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, as we read in John 1, 29. But that's not all. He wasn't fulfilling the Passover, the Old Covenant, for the purpose of retiring it. He was fulfilling it precisely by transforming the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover of the New Covenant. And he did this by celebrating what was very familiar to all of the 12 disciples, and that is the Passover. But I, I said, you know, it's, it's important to recognize what the Passover was for all first century Jews, because it wasn't primarily a meal. It was primarily a sacrifice. And the meal aspect was really a sacrificial communion upon the lamb, as it was going all the way back to Egypt, as you read in Exodus 12. And so the sacrifice of the Passover was the Passover of the Old Covenant. And then the meal is a sacrificial communion. And this, of course, would have been what the disciples were expecting, and that's what they would have been getting up until one point. When suddenly we read in Luke 22 where Jesus, at the beginning of the meal, took the bread and said these words that we know so well, take and eat, this is my body, which will be given for you. And they must have wondered, what was that? You know, he just improvised, he just embellished, he added something they never heard before. Nobody interrupted and asked him why, because he was back on track. And then later on, near the end of the Passover, we read in Luke 22, verses 18 through 20, what he does near the end with the chalice of blessing, the third cup of the Passover. And that's where he takes this chalice and says, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. You know, there he goes again, just kind of adding some sort of rhetoric, some sort of ritual we never recognized as having been done before. And then they, they might have been wondering why or what it meant, but nobody asked him because in, in, in just a few minutes they were walking to the Mount of Olives where he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then, of course, he was arrested and taken off for torture and execution. But when you're looking back on Good Friday and looking at it in the light of what Jesus said and did on Holy Thursday, the Eucharist that he instituted in the upper room as the Passover of the New Covenant to fulfill the Old, just as the Passover in the Old was not just a meal primarily, but it was sacrifice, so likewise the Passover of the New Covenant is presented, is initiated, is instituted precisely as a sacrifice. This is my body which will be given up for you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many. You know, was he just saying it? No, he was doing it. And suddenly they realized he wasn't losing his life on Good Friday there at Calvary if he'd already freely laid it down as a gift of love for us on Holy Thursday when he instituted the Eucharist. He wasn't, he wasn't a victim of Roman violence and injustice as much as he was a victim of divine love by giving himself as a living sacrifice by instituting the Eucharist. I said to Chris, you know, if the Mass is just a meal, 
then Calvary is just an execution. But if in fact the Mass is the Passover of the New Covenant, then and only then do we find the light that illuminates the dark tragedy of what happened to Jesus on the cross and suddenly we realize it wasn't just rhetoric, it wasn't just ritual. He really was making his body a gift. He was pouring out his blood as a sacrifice. And what he initiated in the upper room is precisely what he consummated there at Calvary. If the Mass, if the Eucharist that he instituted is the Passover of the New Covenant, then we find what the early church fathers found, and that is the key that unlocks the mystery of how what would appear to be a Roman execution is in fact the climax and the consummation of the sacrifice of the New Covenant. And so I said, you know, if you really want to look carefully at the question, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? I think you have to recognize, again, that if the Mass is just a meal, then Calvary's just an execution. But if the Mass is understood as St. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, as the early church fathers all taught, then we really have the key that unlocks the mystery, that he's not losing his life, he's really giving it as a gift of love. But I said a second thing that we need to do, actually this was a, this was a conversation that we had another week or two later, I said a, a second thing that we had to look at to really answer the question, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass, is the language that we use when we speak of the New Testament. Because once again, this is common ground. Just as all Christians agree that Calvary is the sacrifice, but only because the Eucharist is where it starts, I think all Christians also agree on what we mean by the New Testament. And yet I pointed out to Chris that when you look carefully at the New Testament, you discover that nowhere does it ever call itself the New Testament. What does the New Testament refer to as the New Testament? Well, the only time Jesus ever used that phrase, the New Testament, is in Luke 22, verse 20. When he's instituting the Eucharist, he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, the New Covenant. In the Greek, the term is hey, kine diatheke, which can just as easily be translated New Testament or New Covenant. But notice what he says. This is the cup or the chalice of my blood, the blood of the New Testament poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Do what? Well, do the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is what Jesus calls the New Testament. In fact, it's the only time in all four Gospels that Jesus employs this momentous phrase, the New Covenant or the New Testament. It's when he is instituting the Eucharist as the Passover of the New Covenant, and he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament. And then he says, do this in memory of me. This is the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the New Testament. I said, Chris, the New Testament was a sacrament long before it started to become a document. According to the document, according to Jesus' own usage of the phrase, the New Testament, as you read in Luke 22, 20, but also you find it in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25. And in fact, when Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, that's the earliest reference we have to the phrase, the New Testament, anywhere in the New Testament, because Luke hadn't gotten around to writing his gospel just yet. But when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what he's pointing out is the institution narrative. That is, when Jesus instituted the Holy Eucharist. And there again we find St. Paul saying the same thing that Luke shows us that Jesus did, and that is, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Covenant, the blood of the New Testament, poured out for sins. And then he says, do this in memory of me. And what I pointed out to Chris is what the early church fathers pointed out to me, drawing from the words of St. Paul, as well as the evangelist St. Luke, and that is, Jesus only uses the New Testament with reference to the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is the New Testament, and so the New Testament is a sacrament long before it starts to become a document, according to the document. And that's why Jesus didn't go on to say, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, write this in memory of me. He said, do this. And as a matter of historical fact, that's what all the disciples went out doing. After the death and resurrection, they were proclaiming the gospel. They were baptizing new believers, but they were also celebrating the Eucharist. They were doing this as the new covenant, as the New Testament, when as a, also as a matter of historical fact, over half of the 12 gathered in the upper room never ended up contributing a single book to the collection that we now call the New Testament. But not because they were disobeying orders, but because Jesus didn't say, write this in memory of me. He said, do this in memory. 
and they all went out doing the Eucharist as the New Testament, when as a matter of fact, you know, only about well, less than half of them ended up contributing books to the New Testament. But this is also help this also helps us to understand why it is the case that the you know for the first five, 10, 15 years, the first Christians weren't sitting around waiting and wondering, what do we believe? Why won't these disciples sit down and start writing gospels or epistles so that we know our beliefs? Because the beliefs of the early church were based upon the proclamation of Jesus, who never wrote anything, as well as the proclamation of the apostles. He said, go out and preach the word, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And that's exactly what they did, along with the celebration of the Eucharist, which was the New Testament. You know, and so 15, maybe 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, we find Paul writing 1 Thessalonians in the late 40s, around 50. You know, the New Testament books were begun years after Jesus' death and resurrection. But by then, the beliefs and the practices were already in place because this is the family of God. It is not primarily a classroom looking for a text. It is a family celebrating this new life, this new covenant. And I also pointed out to Chris that, you know, Again, as a matter of historical fact, the New Testament books weren't completed until near the end of the first century, probably around 95 or 96 AD. And so when you're looking at the New Testament books and you're recognizing that the New Testament was referencing the Eucharist in the first half of the, 20, uh, the first half of the first century, the New Testament books weren't even finished until the second half of the first century. One last thing I discovered that I shared with him was you know, that you don't find these books actually being gathered and called the New Testament until the second half of the second century. The earliest reference we have is around, oh, 190 AD. Uh, Tertullian and one or two others, like Melito of Sardis, they refer to the New Testament, but they actually are calling these books the books of the New Testament. They're not even calling the New Testament yet, and why? Well, because the New Testament, since the first half of the first century, refers to the Eucharist. That's what Jesus called the New Testament. And since these are the books that were written by the apostles to be read when Christians gathered on the Lord's Day in preparation for the celebration of the Eucharist, as part of the preparation and the first half of their worship, you'd read from the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. And then you'd read about how Christ fulfilled the Old in the Gospels and the Epistles. And since these are the books that prepare us to celebrate the Eucharist, and since the Eucharist is the New Testament, by around 190 AD, we hear people referring to the books of the New Testament. But even then, it isn't until the third and fourth century that they just abbreviated even more and just referred to them as the New Testament. The New Testament was a sacrament long before it started becoming a document, according to the document. And when the document finally emerges, it's called the books of the New Testament, and even then, it's because the document was itself a liturgical document, meant to be read in a liturgical setting on Sunday morning as preparation for the celebration of the New Testament, that is the Eucharist. And I was just pointing out to Chris that if we really want to be New Testament Christians, we've got to be Eucharistic. We've got to recognize that this is his body, that this is the cup of his blood, and the blood is the New Testament the new covenant. It's Christ himself. If it's just a meal, Calvary is just an execution. But if it is the Passover of the new covenant, then we can see how an execution is transformed into the holiest sacrifice of all time. And I also pointed out to him over the course of weeks and months that if Holy Thursday is what transformed an execution into a sacrifice on Good Friday, that Easter Sunday is what transformed the sacrifice into a sacrament. Now, because his body is no longer bleeding, it's no longer buried, it isn't just resuscitated. His innocence isn't just vindicated. His body is glorified. His body is deified. His body has been transformed by the Holy Spirit so that it is now distributable. It is now communicable. We can do this in memory of him and receive nothing less than his resurrected body, which is not only deified, but deifying us to the extent that we receive it with faith, with hope, with love with a real openness to the power of the Holy Spirit transforming us like it transformed the corpse of Jesus and raised him from the dead and ascended him up to heaven as well, where he presides as the heavenly high priest over this amazing liturgy. Now, you know, I have just squeezed into about 20 minutes what took about, oh, 15 or 20 weeks of conversation. 
And it went on for the next two years or more. Uh, as a matter of fact, Chris and I became better friends in this conversation than we were back in high school. But there was a, a, a moment, oh, not more than a moment, there was more like a month or two of silence where I, I, I kind of began wondering if I'd pushed things a little too far because I didn't hear from him in a long time. And then suddenly when I did, you know, he was calling me from his car uh, on a Saturday afternoon. He was all excited and I wasn't sure why. And then suddenly he told me that he and his wife were coming back from going to confession for the first time in more than 30 years. And I'm like, and you're in a good mood? <laughs> he said, yeah, I read your book, Lord Have Mercy, The Healing Power of Confession. And it's like, it's like what you said, it's free health care. It's, it's comprehensive coverage. It's like a divine healing. It's a glorious gift. And he said, but what really excites us is that tomorrow morning, Sunday, we're going to receive First Holy Communion for the first time in more than three decades. And he said, that's really worth celebrating. Since that time, Chris and I have not only become better friends than ever. In fact, he just flew up to Pittsburgh. We had dinner together this uh, three nights ago. But he's also now taking all of his evangelical Bible formation that he got back into the parish, back into his friendships, and, you know, and basically doing what I'm doing. And that is, you know, for years as an evangelical Bible Christian who had, I wasn't just a non-Catholic. I was sort of anti-Catholic because I, well, I, it wasn't prejudice or bigotry. I just had some really deep convictions that they were wrong on these sorts of things. But after going to Mass, after studying Scripture, after reading the Fathers, after so many things kept coming up Catholic, way back in 1986, I became a Catholic. And that's when I discovered, you know, in a certain sense, I had been studying the menu. And then I discovered the meal, that the New Testament was like a sign that pointed beyond itself to something even greater than this document, namely a sacrament that Jesus instituted so that he could give his resurrected body to us to empower us to live a whole new life through the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I want to I say one thing, too, uh, before I start fielding these questions, and that is when you subordinate the, the document to the sacrament, I don't want to suggest that we as Catholics somehow devalue the New Testament by saying, oh, the sacrament is the New Testament and only secondarily is the document. Because in a real sense, when you recognize that the New Testament is a sacrament, long before it's a document, according to the document, you end up endowing the document with an even greater value because you discover that Scripture is, is a sort of um, sacred gift, that it possesses a sort of sacramentality, that when you read the Bible from the heart of the church, when you read the old in light of the new and the new in light of the old, as the church does every single Sunday, you hear the promises in the old that are fulfilled by Christ in the new. You realize that fulfillment didn't end in the first century. The fulfillment is precisely what we're about to celebrate in the Holy Eucharist, which is the New Testament. Suddenly the book comes even more alive for us as Catholic Christians. And, you know, not to win an argument with non-Catholics, you know, it, it, that's not the point. The point is to really show that the New Testament is our common ground. And what a gift that is from our Heavenly Father. But when we study the New Testament and discover that it's a sign that points beyond itself to the Eucharist as the New Testament, that's where I really believe we're going to end up understanding this book in a much more united way. You know, I remember when I was a Protestant pastor, you know, I was in a denomination that was a break off of another one, you know, and any uh, historian of religion can point out that, you know, Protestantism, since it was founded back in the 1500s, has produced well over 30,000 denominations all of which have been founded by sincere men and women who were really convinced that they were getting the Bible right. But when you take the Bible back into the liturgy and read it from the heart of the church, I think you're finding its natural habitat, you know, and that's where I find not only a united meaning, but also a power that is released in our lives so that 1.2 billion Catholics who all come from different backgrounds and races and all of that, share this sense that they really are the family of God precisely because they renew not a contract with a, with a, with a master, but a covenant with Abba Father. And, 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 you know, this, I believe, is not only spiritually more satisfying, it's also scientifically superior. That is to say, when you read Scripture from the heart of the church, when you read the New Testament document in light of the sacrament and discover, okay, the menu and the meal go together in the most powerful combination, you know, I, I think what you discover is the the proper context. You know, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't look you wouldn't respect a botanist, for example, if he took a plant 
up by the roots and then took it into his laboratory and began studying it under the lights, wondering, why is this wilting? Why is it dying? Well, any botanist will tell you that once you take a plant out of its natural habitat, it's going to begin to wilt and die. When you take scripture out of the church, when you begin to read it in a purely academic way or in an individualistic way, you're going to end up with thousands of divisions in this sort of thing. But when you take it back and read it from the heart of the church, in the family of God, I think you're going to find a fullness of faith that is precisely what we receive in Christ himself, in the Holy Eucharist. That's why, for instance, the Catechism says that Catholic Christianity is not a religion of the book. That's how Islam describes itself, Judaism also. And I think that's how I understood my, my faith as a Protestant. But the Catechism says Catholic Christianity is not a religion of the book, but it is a religion of the Word. But the Word is a person, a divine person. The Word made flesh, the Word incarnated. And when you read about the Word incarnated in the Word inspirated, Scripture, again, is pointing beyond itself, but not just to a past event in the first century, but to a sacramental presence that is real in the 21st century. And again, I just want to encourage all of my, uh, my viewers to kind of take God at his word and to recognize that word became flesh, dwelt among us, suffered, died, and rose for us, but comes to us again and again to renew this family covenant with us in the Holy Eucharist. Now, I look at the time and I realize I've gone like 25, 26 minutes. I apologize, uh, but you know, I don't see you, and so it's kind of hard to know exactly when to break and to take questions. And besides, if any of you talk to my students or if any of you have ever had me for class, you know I'm like a fire hydrant. And so I, I don't know when to turn myself off, but I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna look at the questions that I have on my computer screen, and I wanna, I wanna, I wanna address those if you don't mind, okay. First of all, how does consuming the word relate to the Lamb's Supper? Well, in some ways, I already addressed that question. The Lamb's Supper, I wrote about 15 years ago, and I wrote it primarily for Catholics, whereas consuming the word I've written for Catholics, but also for non-Catholics, it's much more gentle. It's much more patient. I spent a lot more time on the common ground of sacred scripture and in the early church just to show how it was in the first 50, 100, 150, 200 years that the Bible really emerges from the church's liturgical life and sacramental worship. But I would say this, that consuming the word is really the climax of a trilogy. It's not just the sequel to the Lamb's Supper. It is that. But after the Lamb's Supper came out around 1999, I came out with another book called Letter and Spirit. Uh, I have it here. Letter and Spirit from Written Text to Living Word in the Liturgy. And I, I kind of took the Lamb's Supper to the next level. And I dedicated it to my seminarians because that's when I was beginning to teach future priests, future homilists, and I wanted to get them excited about proclaiming the word. But when I wrote Consuming the Word, I kind of situated it between the Lamb's Supper and Letter and Spirit so that it is a little easier to grasp. It, it, it could be a first-time book for anybody. Okay, uh, the next question is this. How do we consume the word as Catholics? Well, I would say we consume the word as Christians, not only by studying the scriptures and seeing how St. Augustine put it well. The New Testament is concealed in the old, and the old is revealed and fulfilled in the new. So all of the promises and the prophecies and the predictions are precisely what Christ comes to fulfill as the new lamb, as the new Moses, to bring us a new covenant. But that fulfillment, again, is precisely what we receive in the Holy Eucharist. That's why I point out in the book, Ezekiel wasn't just given a scroll, he was commanded to eat it. Likewise, John the seer in the book of Revelation chapter 10 is given the scroll and he's told to eat it. And why? Because when you taste and see that the Lord is good, you realize that he gives us his word, but that word is not just a book. The book points to something that is meant to be eaten. In the old covenant, we have it all beginning when God said, do not eat or else you will die. Whereas the new covenant comes and says, take and eat, this is my body, which will be given up for you. There's so many, there, there are so many senses in which the new goes beyond the old, but not against it. And I think that's the key for us as Christians, learning how from the scriptures we can really consume the word and that God is not done giving himself to us until we literally do what Jesus said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. All right. Let's see. Um, here are some more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, when we hear the words, the New Testament, what should be the first thing that comes to our minds? 
Well, I think by now you probably know how I'm going to answer that question. When we hear the words of the New Testament, what should come first to our minds is what first came to the lips of Jesus, what first came to the ears of the apostles in the upper room, that the New Testament really is a sacrament, long before it started to become a document, according to the document. And that when we read the document in light of the sacrament, both end up in this powerful one-two combination. They're mutually illuminating. They're mutually reinforcing. It's almost as though you can't understand either one without the other, but they're, they're meant to be inseparably united, fused as it were. All right, um, the next question is, why is reading scripture through the lens of the early church necessary for evangelizing in a modern world? Well, I would answer that by pointing out what a lot of people recognize, and that is the emphasis that has been placed in recent years, especially in the Catholic Church, upon what is called the new evangelization. This was first coined by John Paul back in 1979, taken to the next level in 1983, and then it's really become sort of the highest priority for the church, you know, for the coming century or more. And this is where I think the new evangelization has a lot to learn from the old evangelization, because... When John Paul launched the new evangelization, one of the things he said, I remember, I remember vividly reading this article in the official Vatican newspaper, L'Observatore Romano. And the, uh, the article was a talk that he had given in Rome. And the title was just simply, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. Well, that's precisely where the new evangelization is a perfect reflection of the old evangelization. Because when the apostles and the early church fathers proclaimed the gospel, I mean, they had the same four spiritual laws that Bill Bright, Campus Crusade, and all Christians still share. Number one, God loves us. Number two, we've sinned. Number three, Christ died for that sin. And number four, we've got to choose to believe, to accept that gift and live that life that Christ has given us. But that's not the end of the trip. That's just the first stages of the journey. Those are like the first steps of the prodigal son on the long journey back home to the Father's house. Just as evangelizing is not just a personal relationship, but a covenant relationship. In the new evangelization, that's the way it was in the old. So when you were evangelized, the proof that you were a sincere convert was that you enrolled in the catechumenate, where you learned the creed, the, the Our Father, and the customs of the early church as the family of God. But all of that was ordered to getting baptized and then confirmed and then receiving the Holy Eucharist so that you could renew your own personal covenant with Christ. It's a lot like what happened to me about 35 years ago when I fell in love with Kimberly. You know, I didn't just fall in love. We also grew in love and then we decided to stay in love by entering into a covenant. And so through courtship, we entered engagement. And during engagement, that's where I discovered the truth of that old maxim that when you marry a, a gal, you don't just marry her, you marry her whole family. So likewise, evangelizing, catechizing, and sacramentalizing is about falling in love. It's about growing in love, but it's also about staying in love. And this is why I'm convinced that the Eucharist is the basis for not only evangelizing, leading people beyond a personal relationship into a covenantal communion, into an interpersonal bond of life-giving love. That's why the Eucharist is called the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19.9, as well as in the Mass every single day. And so uh, I'm, I'm going on more than four minutes. I, I was told to, to try to keep it to four minutes. It's probably five or six. But in any case, I think this is precisely how evangelizing today can really reflect the Eucharist on the one hand and also draw lessons from the old evangelization on the other. All right. Um, could you talk a little about the oracle of Jeremiah? How important is it for understanding the New Testament? I think the oracle that the questioner has in mind is Jeremiah 31, 31, because that's the only place in the Old Testament where the phrase New Testament or New Covenant is found. And Jeremiah is pointing out that the days are coming when it's not going to be like it was at Mount Sinai, when God gave the law and then the Israelites broke the law, because the law is going to be written on hearts. It is going to be internalized. The Holy Spirit is going to take that law and give us a new life, a principle of love. And so in Jeremiah 31, 31, we have the oracle of the great prophet Jeremiah pointing to how it is that the new covenant is going to go beyond the old, but not against it, how the new is going to fulfill the old precisely by being kept and not broken, and by being rendered unbreakable by Jesus. But how is that the case? Once again, Jeremiah says, it'll be written on the heart. Why? Because the new covenant is going to be internalized. 
Indeed, when the New Testament becomes the Eucharist and we consume the Word made flesh, suddenly Jeremiah's oracle is fulfilled in a way that I think probably exceeded Jeremiah's own expectations. That's often the case. When the new fulfills the old, it fulfills it in a way that is all surpassing. It's like new wine bursting old skins because, you know, it's like, sort of like how good can it get? Okay, there are some more. Um, let's see. I've read that the cup offered at Passover was like a cup given in a marriage proposal. Christ being the bridegroom asking for the church, the bride. Is this an accurate analogy? Uh, I would say most definitely. It was already true in the Old Testament and still true today in Jewish tradition. You'll find it in rabbinic tradition as well that, uh, that the Passover is understood as a kind of covenant between the God of Israel and Israel. And Hosea picks up on this and other prophets like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah too, that there really is a marital intimacy that God desires. But that's exactly what Christ comes to accomplish. And this is why the New Testament is described at the climax of the New Testament as the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, I, I could have said 33 and a half years ago to my bride, this is my body which is given up for you. And that's what Christ is saying to the church as a groom who longs to give himself, not just in a spiritual sense, but in a holistic, physical sense. Christ says to the church, this is my body, and the bride receives the groom in a life-giving way. This is not just metaphorical or figurative. This is real. This is metaphysical. There's an ontological density to the sacraments that goes far beyond symbolism. All right. Um, what does communion mean for non-Catholic Christians who practice communion in their churches? Well, that's a good question. It's a hard one to answer briefly. You know, I've, I've kind of covered the spectrum in my own spiritual life. I started off in a parachurch sort of organization that wasn't part of any denomination like Young Life. And then I've also been a Baptist for a while, then a Presbyterian minister before becoming Catholic. And I think we all recognize the value of the Lord's Supper, as it's called, outside of uh, the Catholic tradition. I would say this, and I'm trying to be accurate in terms of what I understood when I was in a Baptist church up in Massachusetts. For Baptists, the Lord's Supper is very special. It's like a hug. It is an expression of real friendship. But for a Presbyterian, and I would say even more for Lutherans and Anglicans, it's more like a kiss. I mean, it really is more than just a token of sincere and deep friendship. It's a sign of deep love. But for Catholics, echoing the early church fathers, I think the only accurate analogy is marital union, a one flesh embrace where the two become one. That's why it's the marriage supper of the Lamb. So on the one hand, it's a supper, but in a, more, in, a, in a much deeper way, it is a one flesh communion. And this is what Paul is alluding to in Ephesians 5, as well as parts of 1 Corinthians and elsewhere. So is it a handshake? Is it a hug and a kiss? Or is it a marital act of interpersonal communion? I would say that for us as Catholics, it's this especially. And it takes up with these other aspects as well. Uh, but this is sort of the, uh, the spectrum of opinion out there in an oversimplified way. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, do you have any tips on how we can evangelize on a daily basis in our homes and workplaces? Uh, yes, I would say this, that if evangelizing is ordered to a covenant relationship and not just a personal relationship, then family bonds and friendship are the most, the most appropriate expression for sharing the good news. So, for example, if you go to work on Monday and you go in and you're sitting at the water cooler uh, and it's coffee break time and you say to your fellow workers, you know, uh, you start talking about a, a movie that you saw on Friday night that you really enjoyed or a restaurant that you went to Saturday evening and the cuisine was just off the charts or a book that you finally finished on Sunday afternoon and you just wanted to recommend. Nobody's going to think you're weird because you're trying to shove this restaurant down our throat or some movie or book. Friends just share what they enjoy in life. And I would say at work or at home, what we ought to do when we evangelize is we don't, we don't pull out a Bible and just start preaching. As Pope Paul VI said, we bear witness to the truth of God's word as we have experienced it. We are witnesses to the truth as we have personally experienced it. And that's why we can say to someone, you know, I grew up Christian or I grew up Catholic, you know, and I don't think I really appreciate it. But lately, I've been coming to an understanding, and it's exciting. It's beautiful. I'm really enjoying it for the first time in a long time. Nobody's going to think, oh, you're just shoving the Bible down my throat. I mean, they might not ask any more questions. They might be uncomfortable. But the fact is, that's what friends do. 
And that's what friendship is for, to share the things that you enjoy in life. And that isn't just movies or books or restaurants. That's also experiencing the faith in a new way. And I think that's the best way we can do it on the job with our coworkers, but it's also the best way we can do it, the best way we can do it at home with our family members. And I would also say this, that if your family members have kind of drifted off and they're not practicing their faith as Catholics or as Christians, maybe the best thing to do is not, maybe the best thing to do is to avoid an argument. Give them a book, you know, you could loan them a consuming the word and say, read this, you know, but let me know what you think. I mean, give me your honest feedback. And feel free to recommend a book or loan me one so I can understand where you're coming from better. Because that's, you know, it's better to build bridges that way than to dig ditches and to kind of, you know, give them this book for the purpose of setting them straight. I mean, especially adult children just find that to be a real turnoff. And I don't think that's our role as parents, friends, or co-workers. Again, I think I went longer than four minutes. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, let's see. What is the connection between your book and how does it solidify why, why we do what we do as Catholics? Okay, I would say, again, Consuming the Word is one of those books that non-Christians could read and say, okay, I think the faith makes better sense. I think non-Catholics could read and say, I'm beginning to understand Catholic Christianity better. But I think when Catholic Christians read this, they're going to discover a new depth. Not only that this is true, but that the truth is powerful. And not just powerful, but beautiful in the deepest dimensions of who we are as people, as humans, not just as Catholics or Christians. And I would also say that this is going to connect well to what we've been doing ever since First Holy Communion, really since our baptism as well. You know, when you grow up in a family, you often take things for granted. I mean, I, we've had, we have six kids and now we have grandchild number eight on the way. And, you know, and when our kids grew up, we would gather at the table. You know, it wasn't like our kids would wake up in the morning and say, oh, wow, we're family, pass the cereal. I mean, it was just sort of, you know, past the frosted flakes, and we generally took each other for granted because that's what families do. But sooner or later, when you come to special events, you know, uh, three of our kids are now married, or when you come to the birth of a grandchild, that's all of a sudden when you look back and realize, man, have I been taking a lot of grace for granted. And you want to go back and make up for lost time. And I think that's what all Christians can do with this book, Consuming the Word, but especially Catholic Christians. They're going to recognize that, boy, I've been going to Mass all my life. I've been hearing Scripture. And it's almost always the old and the new. The promise is fulfilled by Christ. But I'm going to go back and lay hold of Scripture, and I'm going to consume the Word and Holy Eucharist in a new way. At least that's my prayer, and that's my hope as well. Okay. Um, other than taking communion and attending Mass, how can we draw close to God? I would say read Scripture. I mean, think of Luke 24, Clopas and his companion, and how they related their experience of walking and talking with a stranger for hours. Of course, it was the risen Lord, but they didn't recognize him. But when they recounted that experience, what did they say? Did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up the scriptures? We got to open the scriptures. We got to read them. We got to experience that same sort of spiritual heartburn where our hearts are burning within us, and then we can turn around and enter into the mystery of the Holy Eucharist in a much deeper way. But we can also live out our faith with more gratitude and joy, and I also suspect uh, infectiousness, you know, as it were. Uh, I would also say prayer, prayer, and prayer. In the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, and the end of the day. Entering into a conversation with God that goes beyond the rote prayers that you learned when you were a kid. Don't get me wrong. I, I pray a rosary every day. It makes the Bible come alive. It really makes me know myself to be a child of God. But also conversational prayer, or what we call mental prayer, where you just open up your heart and you pour it out to Abba Father, and you really share your concerns as well as your gratitude and all of that kind of stuff. So scripture, prayer, the sacraments, and just spiritual friendship with other Christians as well. Uh, there are like three or four questions. I'm going to get to all of these things. Okay. Um, Let's see, what was the significance of the temple veil being torn in half when Jesus died? Well, you know, Jesus said back in John 2, destroy this temple and on the third day, raise it up. Some people think that when the temple veil was torn, this kind of opened up the living way for us to enter the Holy of Holies. But that wasn't how Jews understood it. It was a sort of, uh, it was a sort of uh, bad thing because when the veil was torn, uh, that didn't kind of open up, you know, the way so that all Jews could enter the Holy of Holies. What that did was, in effect, desecrate the temple. 
And this is probably at least a provisional fulfillment of what Jesus said. Because when a temple is profaned, it, it ceases to be a temple. It has to be reconsecrated, rededicated. So when the temple veil is torn, when the flesh of Jesus was torn, I think what is happening is what the book of Hebrews calls a new and living way is opened up. Not into uh, the earthly Jerusalem and a man-made temple, but to the heavenly Jerusalem and a temple not made with hands, which is precisely the resurrected body of Jesus. The resurrected body of Jesus is the Holy Eucharist. It is the high priest. It is the lamb. It is the altar. It is the temple. All of the things in the Old Testament liturgy were like spokes in the wheel that converged upon Christ. Christ is the fulfillment and the reality of the temple, the altar, the lamb, the high priest, and everything else as well. I think that at least that's an attempt to get at the heart of your question. Okay, what other books or resources should I read to further understand this topic? I would recommend The Lamb's Supper and Letter and Spirit, uh, two books that I've done. But I also recommend another book written by a very good friend of mine, Dr. Brant Petrie, entitled Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. You get this book, and I tell you, it is going to make sacred scripture come alive even more. And it sort of like picks up where I leave off in, in my books as well. So Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Holy Eucharist uh, by Dr. Brant Petrie. I would highly recommend that. I'd also recommend another book called The Bible. You know, don't ever miss out on that because of the other books that you're reading. Go back to the Bible again and again. And for that matter, also pick up a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There's never been a catechism in the history of the church as saturated in sacred scripture as this one. Don't be put off by how big it is, because if you just read two or three pages a day, you can get through the whole thing in a year. And you're not only going to know the faith better, you're going to be able to read the scriptures much better as well. All right. Um, do you ever give talks to non-Catholic Christians? Yes. I have been back to Wheaton. I've given talks at the Billy Graham Center three or four times. I've spoken at Lutheran and evangelical seminaries and colleges and this sort of thing. And again, what I want to emphasize now is sort of what I want to emphasize there and then. And that is, we share so much more in common as Christians than, you know, we tend to realize. And like in any family, you tend to obsess with the differences and the disagreements. That's okay. That's understandable. But let's start with the common ground and recognize that we share the Bible. We share Jesus. We share the Holy Spirit. We share prayer. We share all of the things that we read about in the Gospels. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he actually performed these miracles, that he died for sin, that he rose from the dead, that he poured out the Holy Spirit, that we come to share the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the key for us understanding the Word of God. I mean, from there we can discuss our differences, you know, but that old line, let's agree to disagree agreeably, you know, I would say let's agree to disagree fraternally. We you know, we're separated brothers, but we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we got to begin and end the conversation by celebrating the gift of God our Father through the sonship of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, what are you studying now and what is your next going to, your next book going to be about? Okay. What I'm studying now, <laughs> I'm reading uh, Father Ku's book, God the Father and the Theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm reading Pope Benedict's book, A School of Prayer, uh, as well. And uh, Ryan Topping's book, Rebuilding Catholic Culture. I usually read two or three books at once. I'm also finishing up uh, the last touches on a book that will be coming out in about a, a month and a half. It's not a small one, like considering the word. It's a real big one. It's called Politicizing the Bible, The Roots of Historical Criticism, and the secularization of scripture. And it studies how scripture was sort of mishandled from 1300 to 1700, where the Bible really was politicized and secularized. So you can look for that in, oh, I would say uh, early to mid-August. Uh, I'm also working on finishing a commentary on Romans, another book for image called uh, Angels and Saints that will be out sometime next year. And I always have two or three other projects. I should mention too, that I've just begun a year-long sabbatical for the first time in my life. I'm kind of excited about it because I'm going to be able to finish these projects, but I've also, dis I've also sort of prayerfully discerned and decided to do something that I probably wouldn't do apart from a sabbatical, and that is pilgrimages. I've done pilgrimages like once every two or three years in the past, but starting in January 2014, Kimberly and I are going to be lead leading a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And i got to tell you, nothing makes the Bible come alive like going to the Holy Land. And then in February, for the very first time in my life, I'm going to have a prayer answered. I'm going to be taking a pilgrimage to uh, Guadalupe uh, and to look at the tilma and just to really enter into that great gift of our Lord and Our Lady. 
And then in March of next year, I'm going to be going to Rome to lead a pilgrimage there to celebrate the one-year anniversary of Pope Francis becoming the Vicar of Christ and the successor of Peter. And then finally, in May of next year, Kimberly and I are going to be leading a pilgrimage to Fatima to celebrate the great apparitions there of Our Lady of Fatima, as well as Lourdes. So you can, you can look at my Facebook page, which is Scott Hahn. Uh, I'm going to be posting these things, or you can go to this uh, group called 206 Tours, and I would recommend, you know, prayerfully thinking about whether you might be able to join us on one of these pilgrimages, because like I said, for me, on sabbatical, I really want to pray, I want to do another retreat, I want to really grow spiritually before I just kind of go back and work hard, because I, I find that the roots are the key to the fruits, that if we, if we just work ourselves, you know, into exhaustion, we really dry up and wither. And I think Jesus is constantly reminding me, Scott, I, I want to draw you closer to myself more than I want to use you to draw others close to me. I'm, it's both and, it's not either or, but it's always be a disciple first and then an apostle second. And I suspect that might be applicable for, for you as well as for me. Okay, uh, how many books on, uh, on those shelves? <laughs> how many books are on the shelves behind? Okay, have you read all of these? I've read most of the ones on the shelf behind me because I'm working on various projects and I'm teaching courses, but you're just seeing my home office. Outside the door, there's between 35 and 40,000 books. If you pick up Consuming the Word, you'll discover in the opening chapter that I've been consuming books for about 40 plus years. And so uh, this is explaining why I have uh, such an enormous collection. They're also all cataloged and computerized so that we have, you know, students, dozens of students coming by the, the library here in my basement in order to use these throughout the school year and that sort of thing. Um, let's see. I wanted to also mention the fact that, um, uh, let's see, the, um, the trilogy that I spoke of earlier, Lamb Supper, Letter and Spirit, and Now Consuming the Word, that's the trilogy that is sort of in the foreground. In the background, I wanted to also recommend some books that deal with the covenant, with the Old and the New Covenant, as well as the New Testament. Uh, one that really is near and dear to my heart is called First Comes Love, uh, Finding Your Family in the Church and the Trinity, because one of the breakthroughs for me was to discover that the covenant is not a contract. In a contract, this is yours and now that is mine. But in a covenant, I am yours and you are mine. It forges sacred kinship bonds. And that's what God established with us as a father who sent his son to pour out the Holy Spirit, the spirit of sonship, to make us one family. So first comes love. I also wanted to mention a book called Swear to God, The Promise and Power of the Sacraments, because sacramentum is the Latin word for covenant oath. And you just make a promise, all you have is a contract. But when you invoke God's holy name, you are sworn a covenant oath. That's a sacramentum. And that book goes into how in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for swearing a covenant is literally shava, which means to seven yourself. How significant that the new covenant is established by Christ, not with one or two, but precisely with seven sacraments. Those are covenant oaths, that whereby God as a father binds himself to us through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, this book, Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Explain, and Defend the Catholic Faith, mostly from the Scripture, seeing how God is a father who, through a series of covenants, is fathering a family. It was just a marriage in the Garden of Eden. It becomes a household aboard, aboard the Ark of Noah. It becomes a tribe when God renews the covenant with Abraham. Twelve tribes that form a national family in Moses' day. But that national family has become an international family, a universal family. What is so new about the new covenant is precisely the fact that it's international. It's, it's universal. And the word that was used for that is katholikos. It's a Catholic family. And so the Catholicity of the church as the family of God is precisely the proof that God has fulfilled his fatherly plan by kind of tearing down the walls so that it's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. All of us, through baptism, are reborn into the family of God. And uh, not that I feel any excitement about this sort of stuff, you know, but, uh, you know, even if there's nobody in this home office of mine, I, I, I can't help but uh, find this irrepressible sense of wanting to... I want to set you on fire. I just like our Lord said, I, I came to set the earth on fire. Okay, that's it. I want to thank all of you for viewing this live streaming, especially those of you who stuck with me till the end. I also want to let you know that you can order the, uh, the book, Consuming the Word, uh, from any of the online retailers or your local bookstore. And I'd really encourage you to support your local Christian bookstores. And uh, 
and, and not just for this book, but for all of your purchase as well. And from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me in this hour. And uh, I, I'm just going to send my prayers out to you. And please remember me and my family in your prayers. God bless you, dear brothers and sisters.